so this is um I'm, I'm talking about a building as a drawing, which is um, on site, so you can, we can go and have a look at it afterwards, or you can go on your own. And it's, uh, you know, in a way, it's co co written with uh, Hugh. Hugh was very helpful, and uh, Neil, and many people, although I'm not assigning responsibility for what I'm going to say to you. <laughs> um, so I'm going to read it cause, so we can get on with it. Um, Okay, so it's a, um, I'm presenting an idea which maybe is a bit annoying and contentious, so I'm really inviting you to disagree with me if you feel like it, um, and, uh, and, and certainly Hugh if you want to join in, <laughs> or Neil for comment, um, I'm open for that too. So, um, when I told Neil about this project, he, said, he immediately sent me these two as a... As a References, so they're kind of like almost like illustrations for my first point. So, is it possible to capture the instant when building becomes architecture in a spectrum of possibilities contingent on the culture and social positions of those deciding? Probably not, unless the situation is specific and the socio political parameters agreed, as in the case with a received canon, for example. Let's begin instead with the nature of that transition from building to architecture, called here the Doric moment. The description and examination of this term has three parts. Following an explanation of what I mean by this problematic term, Dor Doric moment, about which I have had various heated discussions, is a presentation of the design process and the location of the architectural in the cow shed at Shatwell Farm in Somerset, England, designed by Stephen Taylor Architects and completed in 2012. Finally, a look at selected interpretations of this building, both in subsequent drawings of it and manners of inhabitation, returns to consider briefly an expanded idea of how a building becomes architecture. In his 1977 essay, Reversible Faces, Danish and Swedish Architecture, 1905 to 1930, Dimitri Porphyrius elaborates on what he terms a Doricist sensibility, as a means to perceive what architecture is or could be. He attempts to reclaim its definition, both from the clutches of the formalist or from the perspective of his time linguistic concept of style, and from the capitalist affiliation of institutionalised European modernism. He finds expression of the Doris' sensibility in the early 20th century Scandinavian architecture. In this specific situation, the classical and the vernacular instead of existing as two styles of the market, as he calls them, are of the same kind. For Porphyrius, both vernacular and classical architecture constitute an act of building sustained by a logic of construction and a mythology of rootedness to the land. The locus in which architectural knowledge is formed is no longer the revival of tradition or memory, nor is it the representational garden, he says. Instead, architecture makes possible the summation of the essential knowledge of building and dwelling, showing itself in a form of primitive essentialism. The Dorothy sensibility at the heart of Porphyrus's argument is activated in the fluctuation between the classical and the vernacular, a state of incessant irresolution, as he terms it. Stan Allen, in reference to Frampton's interpretation of Porphyrius, sees it occurring when the classical and the vernacular coincide, as in Sigurd Leverance's Resurrection Chapel at the Woodland Cemetery in Stockholm. There's a weird tension in these blank facades, he says. All of the proportions are slightly off, and of course, if you know the project, the portico is in the wrong place. A tension is created by the ambiguous meaning inherent in this moment of oscillation between two states, the classical and the vernacular both of which are considered to represent immutable values. This productive tension between two states can be identified in other situations. At this point, I want to make an analogy with medieval translation. As acts of interpretation, these are relevant to the reflection in the third part of this paper on how the cowshed as an object is represented. Monastic orality was anchored in the written classical texts. The meaning of these texts, performed through reading and singing, could not be comprehended, however, without a knowledge of Latin. In response to this, teachers such as Nocca the German at St Gallen in the 9th and early 10th centuries continued a tradition of translating classical texts into a written vernacular language begun in 6th century Ireland in England. These linguistic traditions, in Nocca's case Old High German, had previously only existed in oral form. 
the distance in meaning and the necessity for inventing various bridging mechanisms between lived speech and its formalisation as writing, not least punctuation, led to the use of defining glosses that fix the meanings, spellings and nuances of words whose contextual essence would be perpetuated long after the worldview that produced them had dissolved. These glosses, it could be argued, constitute a form of Doric moment. Perfurus's concern with universal primitivism or primitive essentialism can be seen as a reflection of the ideologically driven return to origins popular at that time, which was able to countenance the possibility of a true and primary essence of the architectural act. At the same time, it justifies the classical as timeless and immutable and therefore as relevant, as relevant in his present as it was in the past. The Doric of Perfurus's Doric sensibility is not the classical per se, but rather the first expression of what the classical is. That is, the moment of transition become immutable. The Doric moment happens when a local response is subsumed by an assumption of the universal. As Lyle March Phillips says in The Work of Man, 1932, in his comparison of the Gothic conflated here, I acknowledge, with the vernacular and the classical. The Gothic is a picture of contemporary life, he says, in contrast to the aloofness of the Doric temple from life. If the Doric is the immutable embodiment of an idea, the vernacular is an active response to a stable condition or Porphyrus's mythology of rootedness to the land. So at this point, I'm just going to point here to a, cha a chapter written by Martin Bassani, who may completely hate how I've in interpreted his idea. So yeah, bear with me. <laughs> at this point, Martin Bassani's essay, The Pest and Controversy, introduces an interesting perspective on the relationship between the local and the universal, and how the concept of primitive is generated out of the hegemonic viewpoint. Highlighting Le Brust's reversal of the chronology of the three structures at Pestum, assumed by the French Academy de Beaux-Arts, he reveals the significance of locality, not just in a physical sense, but also culturally. Specifically, Brizani explains Le Brust's position, which was based on first-hand analysis and the recording of the ruins themselves. One of the most notable aspects of his work is indeed the issue of chronology, he says. Delegret saw the Temple of Neptune as the last built of the three monuments, as its forms came closest to the classical Greek temple. The Basilica and the Temple of Ceres, whose forms were comparatively more primitive, were judged the oldest. Le Brust, in contrast, supposed that the Temple of Neptune's Greek purity indicated that it had been erected first while the two other structures were the fruit of a process of adaption to the new colonial environment. He quotes Le Brust, These two monuments alone present the typical architecture of Posidonia. Okay, so now I'm going to move on to the second part, which is looking at Stephen Taylor's drawings for the cow shed, which is you can go and look at later on. Um, and I, I did think, think that I brought the three stages, <laughs> which I looked at with Hugh. And Hugh, and then at this point, Hugh and I had a really fascinating conversation in his office. Hugh was the um, estate manager at the time, and so has a great deal of insight into the process. I want to talk to Hugh later. <laughs> so in the second part of my talk, I'm going to quickly show you three stages, well, two, in the design of the cow shed on site here which in the manner of Le Brousse can be described as a move towards the typical architecture of Shatwell. There is no time for deep analysis here, but it is interesting to follow how the location of what is formally and spatially architectural moves and changes over time. Also to reflect on whether there is one Doric moment, whether it is indeed temporal and what constitutes its conceptual nature. In this first proposal, which is this one here, is that right here? Uh, no, it's this one, isn't it? This is the first one. So in this first proposal, yep. the cow shed is sited at the top of the lane leading down the valley to the farmyard and remote from it. The facade in which the architecture is predominant, shown here, is the southwest facing gable end. So thank you. <laughs> so the short end of the, the short end basically of the of the of the barn. Uh, that faces at a significant different distance the cluster of farm buildings that have become drawing matter. So you can see here are the buildings of drawing matter. Here's the site of the cow shed. Very long way away. The, build, the, the, the facade that's relating to the buildings is this one. This one here. So this is where the architecture takes place. The long facade is defined by the off-the-shelf barn structure. 
Thanks. <laughs> um, vernacular in its conformity and availability to all farmers seeking sheds for their livestock. The only divergent feature seen in section is an overhang. In the second iteration, the site of the cow, the, the site of the cow shed has moved to the place in which it now stands, in a constellation with the other farmyard buildings and including the proposed hay barn across the valley. So here you need to, here's the site plan here. So you can see there's the cow shed as it stands, there's the hay barn. Um, this is where we are in Hughes built wonderful buildings in the archive. Um, so in the second iteration, it's moved um, the principal facade, where the self-conscious or architectural is predominant, shifts to the nor long northwest facing elevation. So it's no, now no longer here, but it's there. Um, moving down the valley, it joins the buildings nearby and gathers a space between them. The long facade is now defined by a row of columns. Their form has a deliberate self-conscious character. These are applied to the facade and so clearly not load-bearing, the overhang is gone. So in the final stage, sorry, I forgot the drawing somehow didn't get printed out, but you can look at the building. So in the final stage of the cowshed design, more or less as built, the columns have become simple in situ concrete cylinders using aggregate from the valley. They define a narrow colonnade whose morphological meaning is ambiguous. An in situ concrete arch is applied at each end to the outside of the frame to terminate the colonnade. This, these each make a powerful, discrete character within the ensemble that recurs in images of the farmyard, sometimes as a dominant motif. And I think that the, 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 uh, the Caesar sketchbook. Mm -hmm. I think that, that I think that his sketch, which is really he's making a sketch of the columns, isn't he, Neil? Um, here. He's trying to locate where the columns are. Yeah. So you can see, like, this is the representation of the, yeah. of the cow shed. So it's, it's curious. That becomes the, the architectural facade. Although the columns... Um, anyway, it's, it's all, in, all, all up for debate. OK, so the, the part three... And here we're looking at the John Cage score of 4 minutes 33 seconds. Um, so this final part of my talk considers the conceptual realm between the object and the drawing as a site for the Doric moment, when the nature of the object changes. This echoes a relationship between the spoken word and text mentioned earlier when discussing medieval translation. Or an example on the table is the John Cage score for 4 minutes 33 seconds that transforms the feel, field of existing sound into music. Um, I, don't know, do, uh, it, I don't know if you know, I'm sure everyone knows this piece, but it's a no sound. It's the, the sound of behind you made into music by just making the frame. And what's this score, which I got from the Barbican Library, which has a fantastic, um, it has various iterations of, of the, of the um, like that for example. So, it's, <laughs> so this, this, this representation of the sound that we live in um, is, is made in several different ways. Um, I don't want to look at that. Um, so, where am I? Yeah. So, yeah, looking at the Caesar sketchbook, the Vianda Vilda sketchbook, and then San Jacob drawing of the opera, which is here. Uh, this one here, the coloured, that, that, that's, that, that's a drawing by Sam Jacob for an opera that took place in the cow shed. Okay. And then this is a drawing by a student of the, of the, um, of the, of the uh, I mean, there, there are two copies of the um, farmyard. Uh, this is the cow shed now full of people. Uh, and this is uh, Sam Jacob re reusing um, a, a, an object that he made. And uh, here's a lovely, sorry, a lovely photograph, which is actually in the collection um, of, the, of the object. Um, so, at the start of this paper, at the start of the paper, the question was, is it possible to capture the instant when building becomes architecture in a spectrum of possibilities contingent on the cultural and social positions of those deciding, which I'd like to re revisit now by showing evidence of the life of the Kausha during its life as a building. The expanded idea of how a building becomes architecture that I want to propose is that the Doric moment of transformation into a cultural object can take place through redrawing and inhabitation. Both of these acts create a meaning for the building as object that self-consciously places it in a cultural location. 
One version of this is described by Gérard Carty, who visited with his students from Limerick. Drawing world is a world within a world, located in the middle of a farm in Somerset. The world of drawing, archiving, storing, managing, overlaps with worlds of making, constructing, crafting materials, and of course, farming. So there are two reproduced drawings on the table. In the site plan with sections and elevation of Shatwell Farm, 2019, by Nuno Santos, a fourth year architecture student from Limerick, the figure of the cow shed is merged into a cluster of the typical architecture of Shatwell. It is a product of a learning process. The other is by architect San Jacob, describing the stage set for an opera held in the cow shed. The set reuses objects made for other events, including the reinterpretation of an unrealised design by Adolf Loos for architect hist art historian Max Vorjak, 2016, seen in the photograph. Each of these takes place within a specific version of reality, a micro form of colonisation <coughs> even, in which the cow sheds can each time become a different architectural object. Alan, you made this connection of the historic moment, also yeah. kind of juxtaposing meanings between the classical and the vernacular, kind of what you were doing also within two time periods. And then immediately also, even already taking them into the buildings, uh, that have been built here, specifically the castle by Stephen Taylor. And I think this moment of creation, I don't really have like a question maybe for you, so I would invite you, um, if you would have a question specifically, maybe let's definitely do that, I would invite you to do that. I'm just in, um, uh, in total awe of the way that you brought us into the, this place, in juxtaposing all the meanings of the layers, um, that are here within the drawings, within the place, uh, and within our own creation. Um, the drawing that I maybe want to ask now is too huge, and it's like, but what's here your Doric moment, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Did you have a, Dor a Doric moment here, designing an, ar an architectural, uh, an archive for architectural drawings? Mm. I'm surprised. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> Um, I'm not sure. I, I, I suppose. I suppose. Maybe, maybe encapsulated. Well, I don't know. I don't know. You've really thrown me. But certainly, when, 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 when Helen was speaking, this kind of this, this drawing that Neil's just the kind of element of the kind of um, loss of loss of innocence, maybe, but somehow tied. I think maybe tied up with the dark moment. It's kind of um, that move and. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure here whether there was or whether I was like deliberately pushing against that, pushing against the dark moment, trying to somehow. I'm not sure. Maybe I'll come back. Yeah, I mean, do you think you were responding to what was already on the site? Um, yeah. What about what you, the story you were telling me earlier about the slope? Which slope? What? Oh, here. Um, yeah. Um, I, I was very much responding to what was on, on site, and I suppose in that, um, a, um, a, um, somehow befriending the vernacular, um, I felt. Um, and, um, <laughs> no, 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 you can talk about, you talk about the slope, you talk about the slope, then what was I saying about the slope, which was... Yeah, this, this idea of Doric moment has provoked lots of disagreements. Mm. <laughs> because Doric is such a, a loaded word, it's like, what do you mean? So, I mean, in a way, that's why I've deliberately chosen it, <laughs> because I like to do that. But, <laughs> because because then, then people start going, I don't agree, no, then, then, then so in not agree, they start to think about it. Um, so, but yeah. I, I mean, but oh yeah, actually no, I have. I, yeah, yeah, sorry. Took it on board. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. No, I have, maybe, maybe I did it, have a sense in in response to the side of and this, I, an idea of the vernacular and the dark moment. I think I um, uh, I, I've always read the site and particularly when we're designing it, it in relation to the topography of the valley and the way that the various buildings relate to the valley, in particular um, the buildings that are kind of elevated up the sides and the buildings that inhabit the base of the valley and the kind of difference in character of that 
and um, to some extent, this was this was like the original. The, the old building was the original inhabitation of the of the valley base. But actually, the the um, the buildings we see up there, the old farmhouse and the and the dairy cottage, kind of lifted themselves away from the rain and the moisture and the and the wet, and um, and the cows were left to kind of inhabit this kind of the base of the valley and and in the kind of subsequent inhabitation of buildings of the valley it was always the the the, the working of the farm and the vernacular that inhabited this kind of base and the kind of Doric moments kind of lifted themselves apart and sat on the sides and I always thought that was a very interesting um, history or reading of the site and that because this kind of um, uh, because this yeah, the, the site was kind of given for us, mm. I had a sense of wanting to befriend the vernacular buildings and, and kind of accept the, the, the kind of um, the, the strangeness and the frisson of a, of a, um, of a um, remarkable drawing collection somehow mm. living in the, in, in, the, in the place of workaday cows and so on. Mm. And so I think I kind of deliberately pushed against the Doric moment yeah. in that uh, and kind of, you know, remarked on what Stephen was doing as a, um, uh, but, but certainly pushed against that uh, and enjoyed in pushing against that, the kind of resultant frisson between, um, you know, this, this, what, what we have, the, the kind of inhabitation of these spaces and it's kind of how it inhabits the valley. So what about so. the stone versus wood? Because the, in a sense, the Doric moment could be understood as the transformation in stone of a wooden construction, right? Yeah. So you're doing a sort of reversal where the stone, out, nested in the stone, the, the, the pure cabana yeah. emerges. So there's yeah. something very uh, Doric about that, it seems to me. Yeah. Uh, in some reversal way yeah. where we, we return to the wood, yeah. because we're in this wood but a pure wood, uh, yeah. <coughs> and I think geometricized wood uh, enclosure, which yeah. doesn't show its structure very much. Yeah, and I think I think um, tied in with that, the, the 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 kind of slightly eccentric way that the the building's monolithic um, CLT, yeah. that there's not layering here. It's yeah. a it's yeah. a it's it's solid walls and solid roof, um, and that that. You know that was there, there was multiple reasons for that, um, and certainly there was a kind of um, not an initial reason for it, which was to do, but a kind of something that we then engaged with, which was to do with the kind of management of moisture and temperature in a kind of passive way. But actually, I think the the um, the initial drive was more about the um, the kind of simplicity and directness of the construction that came from that, mm. and maybe in that kind of simplicity. There's, it, it's somehow um, I don't know, balance, ba balancing on that on that moment, perhaps. I mean, for me, that this tension you're describing comes together with your decision to slope the roof with yes. the topography of the valley. Yes. Okay. So that yes, that's what we were chatting about. That's what we were chatting about. So um, when we when we um, it's an interesting thing in that it's very um, you. One can one can be in these buildings for a, a long, long time, and visit many times, and not pick up a certain um, uh, kind of geometric necessity of them. Um, uh, and so that was interesting in our kind in my kind of telling an explanation. But but the 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 original cow building that was here um, uh, actually originally it was it was kind of joined with the next door neighbour in a T shape and the, and the kind of joining component was lost and it became two buildings and uh, it, it was derelict and very very much to do with its relationship with the valley being on the valley edge that actually all the water had kind of the the, the um, valley edge came straight up to the old building so it become kind of um, uh, derelict um, but there's a slight slope to the valley at this point and the building the old building basically sat on the slope so yeah, you everything, see everything sloped. The, the the ground of the building and the roof of the building, and so on. And and in our negotiations with the planners, we were we were required to retain the 
front of the building. It wasn't a kind of uh, a romantic decision on Neil or my part. It was a, um, a necessity to get the building built was to retain a component um, because of the um, listing of the farmhouse. And, um, and because that was on a slope, but um, clearly we didn't want Neil's um, new floor to be on a slope. Um, there was a, uh, a, a kind of negotiation between how, how we would engage with this existing building where the top of the wall um, falls, kind of falls in line with the floor. And the decision we made was that on the ground level we would, we would step, and so that building is, which is up the valley, is kind mm -hmm. of a, few, a couple of steps up from this building, but we didn't want the roof to step because there was, uh, there was something um, that we wanted a kind of tighter relationship with the existing wall, but also we wanted to read it as a single building. We didn't want this kind of dual building. So we sloped the roof so that it actually reads kind of in an intimate, kind of con continuous manner with the, um, with the uh, wall. And when you're on... Um, in the yard and you look, you kind of, I think your eye often assumes that they're both horizontal or that mm -hmm. you don't really read the slope very much. And actually when you're in here, what, what it means is that the, um, the, the floor is horizontal and the ceiling's not. Mm -hmm. So actually the whole of each of these are kind of slightly tilted, but not enough that your eye particularly reads it, except when, you know, with the way that we made the CLT is that actually everything goes up to a particular datum and then the slope's kind of accommodated in the extra bit. So you read here in that piece there, you, see, you read the slope from, you know, it being slightly narrow to slightly wider at one end. Funnily enough, we were cursing you on Monday. Excellent. <laughs> because because I felt it. We were trying to rehang these lamps over the table. Yeah. And they... The, Dave and Alex measured very carefully the length of the wire, but of course, if you hang them in the same position, yes. this I, we could none of us work out why that lamp was two inches lower than this. <laughs> which is all yeah, which interestingly, you know, that, that you've been here ten years and yeah, I still and, got my head and somehow <laughs> still not kind of quite working through the fact that it's on a, on on a, on this. I think there are a couple of sort of comments about him. One is that the buildings, the 18th and 19th century buildings on the site, on the edges of the valley, follow the sloping topography as much as anything because they didn't, the, the biggest expense was digging out foundations. So if you actually simply allowed the building to run with the site, it was much easier. But the other funny thing, I and mean, I hadn't really pieced the sequence together until now, Stephen designs his cow shed, which is very clearly on a horizontal. You then pick up on this idea of the, um, the roof sloping and the ground plane being flat, and then Stephen incorporates that idea into the cow shed, which was built and designed afterwards. So there's something... The hay barn. Yeah. The, sorry, the hay, yeah. hay barn. So there's some not funny sort of yeah. knock-on, and then... Uh, this uh, doesn't sound too um, self-serving and fantastical, but then the hay barn and the cow shed and the existing building on the site then created the site for the Caesar obelisk, sorry, for the Smithson obelisk to make a kind of, um, how should I say, public square between the three buildings. Yeah. I think, um, I mean, back to your talk, I think one of the interesting things about the conversation is that, me and, and your question, um, gradually got to is um is that in in Stephen's building the Doric moment is Doric. <laughs> there's a kind of, there's a kind of there's a literal there's a literalness about it. It's so actually uh, yeah, whereas, but it's but a Doric moment not necessarily Doric, is it? No, uh, absolutely not. No, and the, there's something literal about it. The Doric sensibility is yeah. not, and, not because everyone thinks of it it's a linguistic yeah, thing. Yeah, and it's absolutely not yeah, such. and I, I suppose mean, that's what slightly threw me at first with your yeah. question, in that there is, in, in terms of this building and that building, there is something, this does, I suppose, have a, have a dark moment. It's just, in relation mm. to Stevens, it's confusing, because his is such yeah, a, yeah, exactly. a literal... Yeah. yeah, that's why it's quite good to see this iteration. I just want to say, uh, say something about cars and buildings, and that's the kind of cash and the dark moment, because 
Um, it made me think of, um, uh, I mean, just, uh, just briefly, in, in, um, in, in Moore's Utopia, uh, so the, 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 the island of Utopia is turned into an island by King Utopia's heavenly isthmus, which separates it from the main land, so the kind of, you know, some called birth of the island at the beginning. And there are a series of, of cities in the, in the island, and they have an ideal population. And whenever they go beyond population, the, um, the utopians um, colonize, go back to the land and colonize it. And they believe they have a right to do that because the, um, uh, the people who live don't properly use nature or don't properly, they, they don't properly possess the land. So, so what does that mean? So, um, and I guess what I, I'm, guess what I'm getting to is that the the cow uh, is before the dark moment. The cow comes before architecture, and I, I'm saying that because um, in at the end of the 16th century, we have a project by Sir Thomas Smith, who is the first principal secretary. He's a classical scholar. He's an economist. He gets permission to develop a project for a colonial scheme scheme in the Ards of of Down, County Down, in the northeast of Northern Ireland. He uh, what would become Northern Ireland. He he uh, he develops this according to Roman models of um, of colonisation. He develops uh, a dialogue, which is actually the first um, piece of printed publicity for a commercial venture in in England. I I think. Uh, and the idea is to get um, adventurers to sign up for the colonial scheme. Now, underpinning this is an idea that the native Irish are pastoralists, that they live off cows. And because they live off cows, they wander over the land. But cities and architecture comes with arable cultivation. Uh, the the cow is, uh, doesn't have a, a, a rooted or implanted relationship to the ground. It's what's your wandering uh, or a kind of pastoral life. It's also a highly sort of gender discourse because the natives are then seen as bad, bad husband men. The land is feminized. It desires penetration and the satisfaction of its fertility through arable cultivation. Uh, it, it also means that the natives can't be properly Christian because they don't have bread, they don't have proper bread because they don't go gr grow grain and therefore they can't participate in the, in the sacrament. Um, so there are a whole kind of series of complexes which are sort of pre-architectural, or pre-properly yeah. architectural, yeah. which are tied to the car and tied to the economy of the car. Is, is the uh, issue, so, isn't it? Uh, and, and yeah. actually, in this, uh, at the end of this dialogue between, so it's the dialogue between uh, the the leader of the colonial party, who was Smith's son actually in in actuality, and a reluctant adventurer who's eventually persuaded at the end. Smith's son says right at the end there, have I not set you out in the utopia? <laughs> so isn't there a tension about a cow shed? Yes, there's absolutely a tension about it. I mean, the, the cows are supposed to be wandering around. Yes, yes, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, actually, yeah. and actually, the cows here are kept in for... Yeah. Um, but I mean, the cow is a representation of a kind of this... Uh, Animal at the service of mm. humans. And, yeah. I mean, I have to say, I've just moved into, a, I've just moved to a village in Switzerland, and the cow is super important. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. They, 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 we have the, the Alpad farm, and there were processions of cows with hats on and yeah. massive bells, like two weeks clogging up all the roads in the region. And then, you know, and then the farmers in the middle of the night hear some gunshots, and then yeah. there's this like really weird sound. It's the farmers who. Huge yokes with bells and uh, walking like they. And there's a whole <laughs> ritual structure really around the cow. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the, the it, it is really the interesting. Cow the cow <laughs> is a. I mean, yeah. and I also, but I think what you're saying about colonization, mm. which I think that's why your essay was so interesting and useful to me, is that. Mm. That the color, this application of another way of thinking onto mm. a situation mm. there then makes a kind of architecture in this tension and relationship between something and something else. And I think that relates very much to what you were saying yeah. as well. I, you know, when you were talking, I think, like, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. really... What, what really about meaning making. making and the way in which architects can really combine different historical moments. Mm. Mm. Yeah. And uh, really approaching history in a completely different way than historians. Mm. Yeah. <laughs>
the cannibalize, they hybridize. Ruthlessly. Yeah, ruthlessly. I suggest a beautiful moment to go for lunch. In a meeting with the farmer, we think that people actually want the column like that. What I want is a.